Good morning on a Wednesday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech and more specifically, it's Global Connections with Carl Baker. Carl, until recently, was the executive director of Pacific Forum. Uh, before that, he was with the APCSS for a long time. That's the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies uh, at Fort de Russi. Anyway, Carl, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming down. Yeah, thanks, Jay. I think uh, this whole, you know, global global contagion fear uh, issue is, is a good topic for, for global connections because it really is about globalism. It's about, it's about globalization and, and how do you deal with globalization. And I think that what we've seen so far, you know, in response to this, this global contagion fear is, is really uh, sort of ha half measures based on, on what we have available to us. Yeah, this, well, this is new space. This is new space not only for China, but for the world, and certainly for the U.S., and uh, where we, we are called upon to invent new solutions in the necessity of the time. Uh, and the question, I suppose, is how does this either bring us together or maybe separate us? So, uh, the question posed is what, what are the ge geopolitical implications in terms of uh, China and governance in China, uh, in terms of China's relationship with other countries in Asia and the world? Uh, and the U.S., of course, and, you know, I mean, everywhere. I don't have to list all the, what is it, 70 countries have, have coronavirus now. Um, so the question is, how are their relationships changed? How is the relative power of, you know, those who used to be powerful or maybe not so powerful, how has the relative uh, relationships changed? Where do you start that analysis? It's not easy, Carl. Yeah, I know, and I, I was thinking about that. How do you start this analysis? And, and really, I think where we start is thinking about Think about it in terms of globalization. It's not, it's not new in the sense that we haven't recognized that there's a fear and there's a threat of a pandemic virus or a pandemic something because we've, we've thought about that. There's people who have thought about that. There's people who have said we're not planning for that. Uh, you know, we've had SARS, we've had MERS, we've had uh, H1N1. You know, we've had all these, all these different kinds of viruses. And, and this one suddenly blossoms and it looks like a problem, but it, it's really an old problem. And, and, the, and the real issue is how do you deal with it? It's a collective action problem. And of course, we don't do well with collective action problems because everything is seen through a lens of national security. So the initial measures are all very much focused on, on national security. So we close borders. Well, we know that closing borders isn't fully effective against a, globally, a globalized problem because you have unintended consequences when you close borders, but you also have this global supply chain. So, you know, there's a whole, a whole range of factors that are involved. You have economic issues that, that are, are based on, on the fact that we've globalized our, our economies. And we have, we have cultural factors that make it very difficult to, to close out people coming into your, into your country. So, yeah, we, we, we say, okay, we're going to stop all Chinese. Well, suddenly it isn't just the Chinese. Now it's the, the, the South Koreans, the Japanese, the Italians, the Iranians. It, where do you stop? Do you, do you, you know, do you build a wall for everybody at this point? Because I think that's that's really the the dilemma, and I think that's where we start analyzing it. Is is there an opportunity here for for collective action? Of course there is, but can we actually implement collective action in in this scenario? It's very difficult because we have all these nationalist measures built, and we have a very much a tendency in today's world to to have national responses. I mean, in the past, you would always rely on the United States as, as taking the lead of the international response. We don't have that. We have the WHO trying to sort of be an international organization and, and provide a collective response. And it's, and it's been partially successful, as you would expect from an international organization, because they don't really have the resources. To, to respond to it. Today I saw that, that the, IM, the International Monetary Fund has, has dedicated 65, I want to say $65 billion to the problem. Well, that's another, that's another international organization that has the capacity to, to, to put forward initiatives, but that money has to come from somewhere. So, so you still have to have a national response that recognizes the need for collective action. So I think that's where we start. We start looking at what have we done so far. It's been mostly at the national level trying to contain, trying to, trying to prevent it from getting inside our borders. But the fact is, is that it's going to be very difficult because, because there's, there's 
things. For example, here in Hawaii, we have, we have tourism as the primary engine for our economy. And, and so do we shut off the, the flights to, to Korea? You know, we, we have done, Hawaiian Airlines has done that, but are we gonna shut off all the tourists from Korea? Are we gonna shut off all the tourists from Japan? That puts the, the economy in a very difficult spot. Yeah, well, and time is of the essence, which further complicates it because the steps you take um, need to be in time in order to contain the virus. Um, and I wanted to ask you also about the notion of quarantine. So you say, well, okay, we'll quarantine our country, we'll build a wall, uh, and we won't let anybody in from Korea, for example. That doesn't necessarily solve the problem that quarantine is directed at solving. I mean, quarantine ideally is you find out everybody who's got the disease or is likely to get the disease, and you put them in a room so they can't infect people who don't have the disease. And that's the way you burn it out. Uh, we, we haven't been able to do that. Even China hasn't been able to do that. Uh, for the lack of selecting the appropriate sector, the, the appropriate, what do you want to call it, um, group uh, for the quarantine or for treatment, whatever. The, and we, we haven't learned that. And time is of the essence. If we muck around and don't do that, well, you know, the, the, the coronavirus is going to go further. Yeah, I mean, and, the, and you see that happening, you know, where, where for some reason there was a, there was an out, a community, a, 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 a community in, in northern Italy, someone in Iran, the, 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 the church in, in Daegu, Korea, you know, and, and you can't really prevent these things. Just like in, well, in the United States, apparently, it's in the Seattle area in, in, a, uh, in, an, in, in an old people's home, you know. So how do you, how do you figure out what, what communities you're going to isolate and you're going to quarantine? It's, it's you know, again, I'll go back to the analogy of, of it's sort of a microcosm of, of globalization. You can't contain globalization. You have, to, you have to figure out how to collectively respond to globalization. And of course, a collective action response is always going to be better. But again, in, in today's nationalist tendency, nationalistic attitude toward, toward security, it's very difficult to, to see how you're going to implement that effectively uh, without, without changing your mindset about how you really address security issues. Well, you're talking about uh, you know, national nationalism, patriotism, the boundary of the country, sovereignty, all those concepts uh, which you study for a long time. But in your studies of uh, foreign policy and international relation, um, you know, Carl, at the, at the end of the day, am I right to say we and all of us remain mammals? We remain mammals. And, and, and when I say that, I mean we have emotions and patriotism and nationalism and, you know, dedication to country and all that, protection of country, national security. These are in, in, in some significant part, their emotional reactions, emotional mechanisms. And so if, um, if you say, well, um, Xi Jinping is, is uh, taking people out of their homes or he's barricading their, their doors, or, you know, pretty inhuman things sometimes. Um, and then people react to that. Mm -hmm. Or if one country stops another country, closes the, the gate on another country, or does something which would be you know, treated as uh, clearly unfair in another time, um, people get you know, emotional reactions. And so that's got to enter into the, the factor, isn't it, in terms of planning and trying to reach collaboration. People are emotional about their countries. People are emotional about the implications of quarantine, the implications of you know, the selection, selecting out people for separate treatment. This is all hard, mm -hmm. hard on people. And I wonder how that affects diplomatic relations, how it affects international you know, uh, discussion, international action. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, at this point, it's it's a little bit difficult to tell how this is going to play out because we're still in the in the early stages, I think, of of the response, and so we're still dealing with with initial measures. But what what impact is that going to have on the longer term? I think is is still an open question. But clearly, early on in this in this response, there was a lot of a lot of anti-Chinese racism. I yeah. think I would call it. You know that, that, that uh, several of the old racist tropes about oh the Chinese eat anything you know and and all the all the sort of derogatory comments and and the fact that that uh, you know the 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 total focus was on China in some respects you know China has actually sort of appears to be getting control over over the spread where 
countries like South, South Korea and, and Italy and, and Iran seem to be having a harder time of, of actually getting control of it at this point. Uh, that, now that, again, it's an early assessment in, in the, on the part of Korea and, and uh, Iran and Italy. But I mean, clearly they're, they're in the thousands and the, and the numbers are growing by multi-hundreds where in the last couple of days, China has showed that it, it, uh, the numbers are actually diminishing that are, that are new cases. So uh, yeah, it, it does affect, I think, how we, how we view diplomatic relations. But again, you know, there, there has to be some, some level of, of leadership that can, can address this collective problem. And, and uh, it, it, yes, there is a natural, natural tendency to, to view things through, through, through uh, nationalist eyes and, and what we need to protect our, is our country first and all that. But you, you, I think you really need to, to stop and think about this as, as an example of collective action on global security issues. We could have the same thing in, in maybe 10 years over, over climate change or over, over you know, the destruction of the environment. How do we deal with that? Again, it's a collective action problem. Just like, just like the pandemic health is, is really uh, a, a collective action problem that needs collective action and it has to be funded by the nation states unless you want to go to some other form of government and, and, or some other form of, of, of global organization, which, which isn't really very realistic. You know, if you're, if you're a true globalist, you know, you say, well, let's, let's develop these, these international mechanisms to do that. That's probably not going to happen. So I think we need to find that balance where, yes, nationalism is, is good in, in some respects because it builds identity and it, it gives you, gives you uh, a sense of belonging to, to a, a group of people. But I think we need to recognize that there has to be some compromises. Given what we've done in the economy, given what we've done in, in the ability to travel to, to anywhere in the world, that we have to have some mechanisms to, to actually deal with these collective global problems. Yeah, and, and there are challenges to those mechanisms. And for example, we live in a time of, of governments that seem to be going more to despotism and, uh, you, you know, uh, dictatorships, a, a number of them in the world. And it, it's hard for me to see, or people, I think, in general, to see how they would be doing an altruism a collaborative altruism or an, altru an altruistic collabor collaboration um, because it doesn't necessarily suit their political needs. So the question is, you know, how, this is a difficult question, how do you get there from here? In other words, if I made you the king of the universe, if I made you the guy who could actually pull the strings on all the puppeteers without necessarily making you the king, just the guy who could take the steps necessary or cause them to be taken to achieve the collaboration that we absolutely need. And it's a biblical, a biblical test, if you will. Um, what would you do? Because the United States, as you mentioned, has been the leader of the free world and the world in general since World War II. And, you know, for a good part of that time, not all of that time, a good, we've done a pretty good job and we brought people together. We, we're not the reserve currency for no reason. Um, you know, we are the, you know, the bottom line for a lot of countries. And even with China's rise, we remain the bottom line. But um, we have most recently relegated that and most recently turned our back and become isolationist, which is just the wrong direction if you have a crisis like this. So it seems to me, well, let me leave, leave it in your hands as the, mari the marionetteer. <laughs> what would you cause these leaders, all leaders to do? What would you cause existing international organizations like the United Nations, unfunded or ill-funded, <laughs> to do, or the EU, or uh, ASEAN, or any of these multinational groups, what would you cause them to do? Okay, well, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, a, a really, really difficult question. And I think you have to figure out how you create incentives for those, for those organizations and those countries and those dictators to actually support some level of, of international response. Now, of course, you know, the, the old trope is that, well, what you do is, is you find a new threat, you know, so, so you, find, you find a threat that everybody can agree on is a problem. Well, in some respects, a, a pandemic is. And so I think this is, this is an opportunity to, mm, to figure yeah. out how you actually create some incentives, uh, probably economic incentives, to, to respond to this sort of crisis. 
And I think that's, that's where, where you can come up with some creative ideas of how do you create some incentives for, for people to see this as an opportunity to collaborate on, on an issue that's going to benefit them in, in five years or in, in 10 years? Yes, yes. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I, I mean, I don't, I'm not saying it's, it's easy, but I think that, that if, if, you can, if you can come up with a way to, to I mean, and, and in some ways this, this is happening, that, that the, as the supply chains break down in China, you know, there, this, this is sort of accelerating the move to other countries for, for uh, uh, the goods that were manufactured in China. So if, if, you're, a, if you're a despot in, in, say, the Philippines, or if you're, a, if you're a, in, in Cambodia, you know, maybe you do see this as your opportunity to, to actually establish a manufacturing center in, in, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, Philippines, uh, Indonesia. You know, and so you, you actually do benefit from, from this sort of thing uh, by, by sort of re, reallocating resources to, to uh, a, a broader globalist perspective where people then begin to realize that in fact there are benefits to to globalization that it isn't just you suffering from from people taking taking things from your country uh, now I guess the question then is is does that really benefit the United States well I think it does because I, I'm still convinced that that the United States as the as the big economy as the reserve currency as as the the, the one that really benefits from from global economic expansion that we can benefit from that as well and i think that that it it the what the, the nationalist response that that is possible here is not going to be productive and certainly in a place like hawaii where we do depend on on international travelers and international tourists and and other pe people from other countries coming and, and buying their second homes in Hawaii, I think it is beneficial to, to recognize that there is, there is a benefit to the collective action. Yeah, you know, I'm, I can't help but thinking of uh, that, old, uh, that old slogan, you know, uh, plus a change, plus le même. Um, we are living in a time of change, and it's not necessarily voluntary. It just happens. Uh, we have reached a certain point in our biological development, our species development, if you will, um, you know, where things are changing fast and we, we don't have experience to deal with them. And, and um, you know, as you said, and I think this is really an important takeaway from your, your points, is that we're not ready to go to a global revolution here. We're not ready to establish a, a new international order. Maybe, maybe little pieces of it, but not, you know, an overarching new uh, international order. We have to deal with the notions of sovereignty and the countries that have been established, what, 190 some odd of them, around the world, um, you know, this is probably not going to change that. But it seems to me that if I take country A, and country A recognizes, uh, who said this, Mao, uh, every crisis is an opportunity. He might have said that anyway. He, he should have if he did. <laughs> he should have if he didn't. So it's an opportunity for anybody who wants to step in, an opportunity in manufacturing, an opportunity in trade, an opportunity in taking uh, you know, economic risks and the like and, and stepping up. I mean, for example, um, the country that figures out the, you know, how to use that genome information that China provided uh, to make a, a cure or a vaccine, that country will be a global hero for a long time. That's leadership. To solve this problem with you know, one country's I don't know if it's going to happen this way, but one country's uh, biochemical research capability, that will be amazing. But here's this, and this is what I wanted to ask you. So say a country steps up. Say a country decides this is an opportunity like Mao or whoever said, and, and it takes risks and it gets into a more leadership position in the face of a global crisis. Okay? Um, that is going to change the juxtaposition of that country in the world picture. Mm -hmm. That's going to change. That's going to have political, uh, what do we say, geopolitical effect, isn't it? And so can you, can you react to that? Can you tell me how you think that might work? At the end of the day, when this is resolved, hopefully soon, um, the world will not exactly be the same geopolitically, will it? No, it won't. And I think that's, I think that's an excellent point, Jay, is that I th this is how change occurs. You know, crises, how you respond to a crisis is always important in, in the trajectory of where things go. And that's why I said right now what we're in is, is you know, sort of a global contagion fear. And what we can do and what we should be doing is thinking about how do we create this into a global contagion 
prosperity. <laughs> and, and get away from the fear, get away from the opportunity, and go, go to the opportunity. So make it a, a, a global opportunity to respond to global issues. And, and make it bigger than bigger than this particular crisis. And so I think that, that, that that's exactly right. Now, who's going who's gonna to be the one to step up? I mean, if, if China develops the, the, the cure, you know, if they demonstrate the capacity to, to contain the virus for the most part and come up with, with, the, with the, the chemical solution to, to preventing the virus from spreading, you know, then, that, then that puts China in a very good light. If the United States can do it, same thing. European Union, you know, it's unlikely that, that a, a, a smaller country would, would achieve the same sort of stature by, just by developing the, 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 the virus uh, vaccine. But certainly, certainly, I think that that's, the, that's how we should be approaching it in terms of, of global leadership, is, is talking about how do, we, how do we get past this and, and how do we, how do we incentivize people to look at ways to get past it and to and to apply it to other issues like I said this, this pandemic is just one issue that's that's out there that is a global problem there certainly are a lot of other problems that we have oh, yeah. that 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 would would benefit from from finding that way to move forward on collective action so I think I think you know that's that's if I was made king for a day what I would try to do is find ways to, to reinforce that idea that it does take a collective response and that if, if, if you can come up with a collective solution, that that then puts you in a, in a better position to, to benefit you and the, the people that, that uh, benefit from your actions. Yeah, this, this will be over uh, after a while. Yeah. A lot of people may die. Um, maybe a lot of people may die uh, for, uh, from an attack like this. But at the same time, you, you suggest to me, Carl, that we are going to, we are now learning lessons about how to collaborate on an international scale. Lessons, perhaps, that we haven't, we haven't really integrated for a long time. I, I think there was a certain amount of collaboration among the allies in World War II uh, that taught us and, and still lessons that we you know, use today. But this is even more challenging because more countries are involved, more, more risks to the civilian population are involved. And so we could learn, we, I think we probably will learn a lot of lessons we can apply to other common threats. For example, how do you like climate change? If we collaborate on climate change, such as uh, the, uh, the, the, the conferences in Paris have never been able to achieve, if we could achieve collaboration using the, the lessons uh, you know, of the coronavirus, we might be able to really make a dent in climate change. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah. It sounds like a, you know, a bright light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe, maybe I'm not being practical, but what's your reaction? Well, yes, I agree. And, and that's the point I'm trying to make is, is the collective action that we need in this particular instance is, is first of all, to build some trust between countries on, on what they're doing. I saw a clip on, on the news yesterday about how you order food in China these days. And, and the, the guy brings the, the food out to a table, and on that table is the food, and it has the temperature of the person who, who made the food, and the temperature of the person who packaged the food, and then you go pick it up, and you can check all that. You know, so, so put, put that, you know, make that as an analogy to how we deal with that at the country level. And, and if you had trust, that, that you know that that other country actually did what they were supposed to do to prevent the spread, you know, then you don't have to have that, that certification of the guy's temperature. But, you know, that's the level of, that's the level of, of trust that you need to move forward on these, on these collective issues. So, you know, I think that that's, that's what could be learned from this. And, and again, you can apply it to, to many other international problems. I mean, you know, we, yeah, we've, we tried to do that with, with international terrorism at one point. And of course, we sort of over-politicized that and made it, made it more, more complicated than it needed to be, probably. Yeah. But, but all, those, all those collective issues need a collective global solution. And, and there's ways to do it. And I think that that's, that's what we should look at, is how we find ways to, to incentivize those collective actions and, and recognize the need to build that trust so that you can actually move that collective action forward. Well, we've, we've all seen, uh, you know, the criticism of the Trump administration and the CDC. We've all seen, uh, you know, the mistakes around the masks and the tests and all this. Uh, we, we've seen, you know, competing advice from so many sources. It all seems, um, you know, fragmented in this country. And I think, you know, we're waiting, we're waiting for a, a bad shoe to drop here. 
Um, and, you know, let me add the thought that if we do a bad job on this, I think we are going to suffer geopolitically. If we have a lot of deaths in this country because of mistakes and silliness and politicization, we're going we're gonna to suffer. Even the United States would suffer because the world will look at us and say, what a bunch of fools. How come they couldn't deal with this? We thought they were the you know, most smartest, you know, richest country in the world. Look at them thrashing around. But, okay, here's the thing. Now I make you Secretary of State or somebody who supervises the Secretary of State. And, and I want to follow through on all the points you've made, Carl. What do you do? What organizations, you know, do you organize? What, uh, what relationships do you or What international efforts do you make in order to be the free, you know, leader of the free world? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a difficult question. But I think what, what you have to do is you, you have to say, let's depend on the international health organizations. So WHO is certainly where I start. I, I certainly start by, by giving them the credibility, by giving them the, the, the authority to, to make decisions about how this thing is spreading, to make decisions about how much, how much quarantine is really helpful, and, and, and rely on, on the, the, the doctors and, and the epidemiologists that are out there that, that understand these viruses. And, and the other thing I would do is, you know, I would, I would sort of get at stopping bad things from happening. And, and the bad things are all the conspiracy theories that are out there. You know, I think that that is something that, that the, the national government can do, is, is instead, of, you know, instead of sort of encouraging ideas that this is really just uh, uh, China working on a, on a, a, a biochemical or bioweapon or something, you know, look at, look at how, do we, how do we really bring science to help us? Rather than thinking about all the all the, the the negative things, look at look at how do we how do we use science and technology to make it better. Carl, what a great discussion! We've covered so much ground here. I really appreciate it. I want you to come back if you don't mind later on as the thing unfolds one way or the other. But for now, I think we're out of time, and I just want to say, when this is over, can we both please wash our hands? Yeah, that's right. Well, well, there's a shortage of Purell, so hopefully there's still soap in the bathroom. <laughs> Carl Baker. Thank you so much, Carl. Thank you. Aloha.